Hi, I'm Lee Nix, and this is Finally a Memory of Malice. I know, I was gone for a bit. I never intended it, but it happened. I'll talk about it a bit at the end of the episode. As for this episode, it's a Canadian serial killer case. I know it's sacrilegious in true crime circles, but I don't like serial killer cases. There are a lot of reasons that none of you are probably interested in, but it makes covering these cases a bit harder. But Lee, you might say, didn't you cover Marlo and Kaufman in a series starting in your second episode? Yes, I did do that, and I hated it the whole time. And I also think those are my worst episodes. Listen to them at your own peril. But I covered them for that sweet, sweet engagement, I won't lie. We've got some trigger warnings for this one. Drug use, sexual assault, including that of a minor, brief mention of self-harm and suicidal ideation, and central themes of dehumanization of sex workers and drug users. I did this episode a bit differently because I wanted to make this story more victim-focused. You will notice I didn't name this episode after the killer, and that is a conscious choice. The killer should not be the main character in this case. But now, let's begin this episode focused on the Prince George serial killings. On December 2nd, 1973, Jill Stacy Stuchenko was born. Perhaps. She might have been born on September 2nd instead. Details about Jill are sparse and hard to find. This will be a common refrain in this episode, I'm afraid. The only information that news outlets seemed to feel was important about Jill was that she had a drug habit and was a sex worker. But there was more to her than her struggles with addiction and the way she made a living. She was a real, three-dimensional human being. Jill had six children, and she was struggling to be a better mother for them. Though her children had been taken into provincial care, the Canadian foster care system, she was trying to overcome her addiction to cocaine so she could get them back. According to Jill's friend, Les Dermid, she had stopped before because they, the provincial care system, were talking about adopting her children, and she wanted her kids back. She was serious about getting them. When asked to describe her, Friends said she had a bubbly, happy personality. She loved to sing and dreamed of being a professional singer. But her home life was chaotic. Her partner, and father of two of her children, had been in prison twice for assaulting her. He would later say that these were the results of the pair's arguments about Jill's drug use, a poor excuse for domestic violence. She wasn't entirely without support. She had friends like Les Dermid. Another unexpected friend was a man named Jim Geller, who she had met during her work. Though Geller had originally been one of Jill's customers, he had feelings for her and would often offer her a safe place to stay at his log cabin outside of Prince George. Jill's attempts to get clean all met with failure. No matter how long she stayed at Geller's cabin, she couldn't ignore her addiction. And though Les Dermid would drive her to rehab multiple times, it never stuck. Dates in this case aren't very exact. We know that sometime around October 9, 2009, Jim Geller offered to have Jill over at his family's Thanksgiving festivities. For those who don't know, Canadian Thanksgiving is held on the second Monday in October, rather than the fourth Thursday in November. But Jill refused his invitation. Geller would later say that Jill looked haggard, and her feet and the bottom of her jeans were dirty. But there wasn't anything else he could do, so he dropped her off around 20th Avenue and Queensway. We know that, in the early evening of October 9th, a local RCMP constable by the name of Mark Hansen stopped to speak with Jill on 20th Avenue and Queensway. I can't be sure this was the same evening that she got a ride from Geller, though. Their conversation lasted three to five minutes before they both moved on. As far as I'm aware, this is the last recorded interaction that Jill had before her death. 
We can piece together what happened to her from evidence, but it's not a complete picture. At some point on October 9th, she was either picked up or called by a young man. He expressed interest, likely in both drugs and sex, and Jill agreed to return to his apartment on Kearney Street in Prince George. She might have felt a bit reassured by the location of his home. Jill's own home was just a bit down the road from his address. She might have thought she had some place safe to retreat to if things went bad. Unfortunately, we'll never know what she felt and thought. Likely during the night of October 9th, Jill Stacy Stuchenko was brutally murdered. After her death, she was tossed out like garbage, partially buried in a gravel pit off Foothills Boulevard. Jill was a lovely, happy woman who dreamed of overcoming her addictions and getting her children back. She loved to sing, and she was loved dearly by her friends and family. But her killer didn't even see her as a human being. It didn't take long for people to notice her disappearance. The current guardian of one of her children became worried when she hadn't called her. Jill kept in contact with her regularly. After some time waiting and worrying, her friends filed a missing persons report on October 22, 2009. Her partner read about her disappearance in the newspaper. He hadn't realized Jill was missing. He came forward with more photos to share with the media. It hardly mattered. Whenever Jill was mentioned in articles or on the news, it was invariably alongside an unflattering photograph of her glowering into the camera with a black eye. On October 26th, Johnny Pius, who has the name of a Golden Age comic book character, was collecting cans near an extinguished campfire by the Foothills Boulevard gravel pit. Unfortunately for Mr. Pius, he stumbled upon Jill's body. He immediately rode his bike to the nearest RCMP detachment to report what he'd found. In a just world, every murder victim would be treated the same. But that's not what happened here. It's hard enough to get the police to investigate the death of a sex worker, but a sex worker who also has a drug addiction? It's fair to say there was almost a blithe unconcern. If you're a fan of true crime, it shouldn't come as a shock to find out that the police don't respect the humanity of sex workers. The cops might not write NHI or No Humans Involved on their reports anymore, but that doesn't mean their mindset has changed. From as early as five days after the discovery of Jill's body, the RCMP was minimizing her death. Constable Gary Godwin told CTV News, I think this is an isolated case because of her high-risk lifestyle. He added, perfunctorily, it's tragic. The high-risk lifestyle excuse is just that, an excuse. The most dangerous jobs in Canada are those in construction, fishing, mining, and transportation. Imagine if a builder, a fisherman, a miner, or a trucker's murder was just ignored by the police because they lived a high-risk lifestyle. The police wouldn't ignore the murder of a police officer. The decision to ignore these cases comes from a place of moral judgment. No matter how dangerous you or I may think sex work or drug addiction may be, no one asks to be murdered. Just because someone lives outside the legal or moral framework, that doesn't make their death something expected or acceptable. Regardless, with the public reassured that there was no boogeyman lurking in the dark, Jill's murder was forgotten. There was only one problem. The police were wrong. <music> Natasha Lynn Montgomery was born on March 14, 1987. In early coverage of her disappearance, she's listed as white or Caucasian, but this is incorrect. Natasha was indigenous, though I don't know her tribal affiliation. At one point, Natasha had been married to a man surnamed Godwin, and the pair had two children, a boy and a girl. However, their marriage fell apart due to the pressures of Natasha's growing addiction to cocaine. Still, Natasha kept in contact with her ex and children, habitually calling every other day to talk to her kids. 
Like Jill, Natasha also turned to sex work to survive. Also, like Jill, she was more than how she chose to make a living. Natasha played softball and figure skated for years, according to her mother, Luann. Like Jill, she liked to sing, and she could also play the clarinet and trumpet. She was both arty and crafty, and she enjoyed scrapbooking and drawing. She liked outdoor activities like camping and fishing, especially with her family. When Natasha ended up in the Prince George Regional Correction Center for the last time, she wanted to make a change. She contacted her mother, and they made a plan to help her get treatment when she was released in September 2010. Unfortunately, the PGRCC released her early on August 19th, and her plans crumbled. Luann would later testify, Natasha said to me she had a drug problem, and she needed help when she got out. She wanted us to be here when she got out, but she was let out when there was nobody around to help her. Maybe her story would have ended differently if she had been released to a loving support system. We'll never know. Natasha returned to the life she had lived previously. She lived in an apartment on Queensway Street with a man named Minton who sold crack cocaine. According to a man named Forsyth, with two Fs, I can't tell you how hard it is not to call him F Forsyth, Natasha and a friend would collect drug debts for a scary character. Sometime in the timeline, Natasha's head was shaved. Depending on whose story you believe, it was done as retribution for drug debts, or as a way to keep cool in the summer months. In September, her hair was still short. On the night of August 31st, or September 1st, 2010, Natasha disappeared. Only one person can tell us what happened to her, and he has refused to tell the truth. But evidence can put together some of the pieces of the puzzle. Natasha probably wasn't afraid to meet the young man that night. She had met him before, and all had turned out well but it's possible that she was uneasy all the same. Another sex worker who had met the man had warned her about him. Something about him tripped her instincts. But Natasha ignored her and kept seeing him. That evening, she came to his home on Liard Street, one and a half kilometers, or a little less than a mile, away from the apartment where Jill had met her death and it was here that Natasha would also be brutally killed. Her exact cause of death is unknown. The body of Natasha Lynn Montgomery has never been found. All that was left behind was her blood. Cynthia Frances Moss was born on May 29, 1975. According to her sister, Judy, Cynthia was born with a disability but I have no idea what her specific disability was. However, she was left more trusting and innocent than an abled person as a result. She was described as kind, someone with everyone's best interests at heart. But this made her more vulnerable, too. Judy told how Cynthia first tried drugs when her cousin told her to try something that would make her feel good. Completely trusting, she did. Cynthia seemed to get pulled into a spiral she couldn't escape. She became addicted to drugs, and she turned to sex work to pay for them. But she seemed to be deeply saddened by the way her life was turning out. She even sent a text to her niece, apologizing that she wasn't the auntie she wanted to be. As an indigenous person, it would be all too easy for Cynthia to fall through the cracks of the system. But she was trying to straighten her life out. We know what Cynthia was doing on September 9th, 2010, because she was filling out paperwork for the Association Advocating for Women and Community, or AWAC, shelter. She also filled out some other forms for a social worker. The same day, she made a phone call to her stepfather. The only recorded contact she had after this point happened the next day, September 10th when she visited the apartment of Patricia Thiessen and Tim Senft. She washed up there, and Patricia gave her a coat. 
After this, she was never seen alive, though that coat would be found on her body. I'm afraid we have to piece together the story from evidence once again. Probably that same evening, Cynthia met a man in Elsie Gun Park in Prince George. Elsie Gun Park is well known as a spot where sex workers take their clients. Somewhat amusingly, it's not far from the Prince George Regional Correction Center. I guess if you get busted by the cops, you won't have far to go. During their meeting, Cynthia was brutally murdered, just like Jill and Natasha. And just like Jill, her body was cruelly dumped. Three women have been murdered, and the police don't even realize they have a serial murderer on their hands. Both Natasha and Cynthia were reported missing on the same day. The media ran a few stories on the missing women, but mostly their loss was ignored. Police made sure to mention the women's high-risk lifestyles in their quotes, and the media dutifully ran them. All the while, two families were terrified, wondering where their missing loved ones were. Before we move on, I think we have to discuss a common misconception in true crime circles. I talked about this before in my Marlowe and Kaufman episodes. There is no magic number that makes a serial killer. I know that people love to say that when three people are killed, that makes a serial killer, but that's an outdated definition. There's a really helpful webpage I'll link from the FBI, Turn Those VPNs on People that discusses in-depth how attendees of the Serial Killer Symposium define serial murder. It defines it as follows. The unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender or offenders in separate events. This is important because it makes this less of a numbers game, and more focused on two important factors present in serial killing, cooldown and methodology. I'm mentioning this because when police found Cynthia Moss's body on October 8, 2010, they had enough pieces to point toward a serial killer being on the loose, but they missed it because they didn't even look. Life seemed to move on for everyone unconnected to Jill, Natasha, and Cynthia. Nearby, a girl was chatting online with a new friend. This girl was 15-year-old Lauren Dawn Leslie, a 10th grader at Nechaco Valley Secondary School, and she had no idea she was flirting with danger. Lauren was a light. Everyone described her as kind, happy, and a girl who would stand up for what she thought was right. She was talented, too. She'd acted in school musical theater productions. Yet another musical soul in this sad story. She was made uniquely vulnerable by a disability. She had been born with no vision in one eye and only retained 50% vision in the other. Legally, Lauren was blind. She also struggled with her mental health. She would self-harm and had what sounds like passive suicidal ideation. She had stayed in a mental health hospital at least once. Additionally, Lauren had problems at home. Her mother was struggling with alcohol addiction, and that is a hard thing to cope with for anyone, let alone a teenager. So Lauren turned to social media, specifically a Canadian social media site called Nexopia. While posting online under the username Ba the Sheep, Lauren met a user called One Country Boy. Through their messages, Lauren learned that One Country Boy was a man from Prince George, whose name was Cody. Cody and Lauren became close, eventually leaving the message boards to trade text messages between them. Lauren's parents had no idea that she was trading text messages with an adult man. At 6.31 p.m. on November 27, 2010, Cody sent a message to Lauren, where he began making arrangements to meet up. He told her not to tell anyone, to which Lauren innocently replied, Well, we're just hanging out, right? nothing sexual. Just before 8.30 p.m. that same evening, Vanderhoof Children's Theater coordinator Richard Ruth and co-worker Noella Hansen were driving towards Nechaco Valley Secondary School to drop off some things when they saw Lauren leaving her apartment. Both of them were acquainted with Lauren, and so knew her well enough to identify her quickly by sight. 
Ruth said that it looked like Lauren was doing something on her phone or another electronic device. And he especially noticed her because she was wearing shorts even though it was so cold out. Ruth and Hansen dropped the items off at the school and headed back to Noella's house so she could be dropped off. On their way, the pair passed McLeod Elementary School, where they saw a few odd things. The first thing they noticed was a truck parked, engine running, near a chain-link fence at McLeod Elementary School. I think this fence probably surrounded a recess or play area, because inside it was a swing set where the pair saw Lauren sitting. They saw a man walking towards her. Ruth noticed that the man was also wearing shorts. I said to Noella, it was bloody cold, and why are they wearing shorts? He wasn't wrong. According to Weather Underground, it was around negative 6 degrees Celsius, or 21.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which was below freezing. I literally can't imagine weather that cold. Hansen herself noticed that Lauren wasn't smiling. Not noticing anything wrong, the pair continued on their way. While in Cody's truck, Lauren was texting with her friend and neighbor, Charity Funk. Charity had texted her friend, asking her to go to coffee, but Lauren apologized, texting that she was driving with a friend from PG, or Prince George, named Cody. She told Charity that they could maybe get coffee the next day. On the witness stand, Charity explained that she and Lauren had fought over something minor, and they hadn't spoken for a week before this night. This was a tentative step towards making up, but Lauren would never have the chance to reciprocate it. There are two different stories about what happened that night, Cody's version and the truth. We don't know the whole truth, but we have a good idea. Cody drove his truck off a rural side road in the Vanderhoof backwoods. I mentioned in my Maddie Scott video just how many of these there are and how easy it is for them to be used for nefarious purposes. This case is proof. I don't think anyone knows what led up to Cody stabbing Lauren. Perhaps it happened after he tried to have sex with her, and she rebuffed him, or maybe he stabbed her first. Either way, Lauren was stabbed in the neck with a knife attachment of a Leatherman multi-tool. It's not clear whether it started in or outside of his truck but it ended outside in the cold snow. Cody took a pipe wrench and hit Lauren multiple times in the head with it. American anthropologist Stephen Symes would later testify that judging by the line of trauma on her skull, Lauren was hit at least four times, with notable force bordering on tremendous. When Cody was done with murder and sexual assault, he dragged Lauren's body past a gravel pit into the brush and tree line. He used a tree branch to try and sweep away his tracks and drag marks, and then fled in his truck. Unfortunately for Cody, Constable Aaron Keller was driving along Highway 27 that evening. Constable Keller was heading to meet another RCMP officer, Constable Kanwalpreet Situ, to give him some property that had been misplaced during a car accident. I apologize if I mispronounce Kanwalpreet. I couldn't find a pronunciation guide for it that wasn't a robot. Keller just happened to be passing by when he saw a dark truck heading down a logging road in what he described as a quick manner. Keller immediately wanted to pull over the driver, but notified C2 first. He didn't want to pull over a poacher and get shot. When C2 joined him, he pulled the truck over to the side of the highway and approached. Before he'd even gotten to the car, the driver had his license and registration in his hand and held out the window. He thought this was strange, and I do too. Maybe it's just me, but I happen to know cops are extra twitchy about traffic stops. Sticking your hand out the window with something in it seems really fucking dumb. Unfortunately, the driver was not shot. Keller took the license, and while he did, he noticed the driver was wearing shorts and a sweater. The name on the license was Cody Lejibakov, and his birth date revealed him to be 20 years old. As Constable Keller stood there, he began to notice other, more troubling things. 
he saw a smear of blood on his chin. A closer examination revealed drops of blood visible on his thighs. At this point, Keller was pretty sure Legibakov had been poaching, and he wanted an excuse to look through his truck for more evidence. When he saw an open beer can behind the driver's seat, he got it. He told Legibakov to get out of the truck so he could search it for a liquor violation. Surprisingly, Legibakov complied. I say surprisingly, because he knew what they were going to find in there. Firstly, as Legibakov got out of the vehicle, Keller noticed more blood on his legs and a puddle of blood on the driver's side floor mat. C2 searched the truck while Keller patted down their suspected poacher. On him, he found a cell phone that would later be identified as Lauren's, and a multi-tool covered in what was described as gelled blood. Fully believing that they'd stumbled onto a poacher, Keller asked C2 to call in a conservation officer. This officer had tracking skills, and they hoped that they would lead them to an animal carcass of some kind. Then Keller also began searching the truck. He opened the passenger side door and saw a small, stuffed animal backpack. A monkey. He opened it and found a hospital card bearing the name Lauren Don Leslie. Alcohol was found in the vehicle. They found a four-pack of mudslides and a four-pack of white Russians. Two of the white Russians were missing, and two of the mudslides were partially consumed. This was a violation of liquor laws in B.C., as you aren't allowed to have open containers of alcohol in a motor vehicle. They already had enough to arrest Legibakov, but they kept searching the truck. Searching the back of the cab, behind the seats, was difficult, because it was packed full of work clothes up to shoulder height. He wasn't living in his truck, if that's what you were wondering. You'll find that Cody Legibakov doesn't mind living among mess. Either on top of or just behind the truck's center console, Keller found a bloody pipe wrench. He observed that the blood was likely fresh, given that there were also fresh clumps of snow clinging to the tool. Inside the console, Keller found drug paraphernalia, specifically related to crack cocaine. It was safe to say that Legibakov would be arrested for some or all of these violations but Keller decided to arrest him for the poaching first. After being read his rights, Legibakov admitted to poaching. When asked why he was poaching, he replied, Yeah, I'm a redneck. That's what we do for fun. Legibakov claimed he and a friend had clubbed a deer to death. Keller commented that people who take turns clubbing a deer sometimes turn into serial killers. He had no idea how right he was. The conservation officer, Cam Hill, arrived on the scene around 11 p.m. and left to retrace Legibakov's tracks. At midnight, he radioed Keller, telling him he'd found a body. Lauren's body. Legibakov was taken into custody. Over the next few days, he would give multiple different stories explaining his involvement in Lauren's death. He started with outright denial, and ended up with some truly disgusting victim-blaming. He had been talking with Lauren for a while, long enough to know that she struggled with her mental health. So, in his final version of events, he told officers that he and Lauren had drunk alcohol and had sex twice that evening. I apologize for the next sentence, which has some ableist language in it, but I think his wording shows his total unconcern for Lauren. He told officers that Lauren suddenly went ape shit and began stabbing herself in the neck before leaving the truck and rolling around in the snow. He said he hit Lauren with the pipe wrench to put her out of her misery. In an earlier version of the story, he tried to convince the police that Lauren had done it all to herself, but he quickly changed his story when he was told that Lauren couldn't have both stabbed and bludgeoned herself. No one believed him. Cody Legibakov was charged with the murder of Lauren Leslie. Meanwhile, forensic teams were searching his apartment on Liard Drive. <music> Cody 
Cody Lechebikov never cleaned up if he could help it. It was actually a point of contention between himself and his roommates. For the life of the three women, they couldn't make him pick up after himself. And thus, he had only made the most cursory attempts to hide the bloodstains. The hardest thing to believe in this whole case is that this man lived in two blood-drenched apartments with three other people, and no one called the cops. His, now ex, girlfriend would testify on the stand that she'd seen a bloody handprint by the front door of the apartment. Both his girlfriend and his roommates would confirm that they'd seen the huge bloodstain on his couch. Lechbikov would explain all of these away with nosebleeds. While moving from his Kearney Street apartment to his Liard Drive apartment, Lechbikov brought his couch with him. During the move, it was discovered that the back of the couch was moldy, for some reason. The roommates helped him remove the mesh cloth on the back of his couch, and discovered that so much blood had soaked through that it had dried into a large, hard droplet underneath the cushion. I just don't understand. How do you see that and not call the police? I certainly wouldn't move in with the man. If nothing else, that's just foul. There was blood all over the apartment, in just about every room. But some of the blood-stained objects were just as important, specifically a picaroon and an axe. If you're wondering what a picaroon is, you're not alone. I had to look it up too. A picaroon is a pickaxe with only one pointy end. After finding so much blood in his Liard apartment, forensic units also searched Lejibikov's prior apartment on Kearney Street. They found more blood there, too. It took some time for the DNA to come back, of course, during which the community grieved the death of Lauren Leslie. Hundreds of people went to her funeral, including her parents and her siblings, who were suffering such an inconceivable loss. That grief was compounded when three more families found out that Lejibikov had murdered their daughters. Blood DNA had tied him to the deaths of Jill Stuchenko, Natasha Montgomery, and Cynthia Moss. I guess this is the point in these stories where we examine the killer, where we try to figure out where it all went wrong. Cody Lejibikov was born on January 21st, 1990, in Fort St. James, British Columbia. By all accounts, his upbringing was a good one. And, according to his family, he was a well-adjusted boy. He was well-liked and athletic. If you listen to his defense attorney, Lechebikov's life went downhill when he began taking cocaine. But I think Cody made a conscious choice to commit murder and sexual assault. Cody wasn't mentally ill. He was a misogynist with violent sexual preferences. Sometimes people just make the decision to do bad things and the only reason is that they want to. The prosecution was pretty certain of their case. They indicted Lejibikov on all four murders. This is considered risky in a couple of ways. Often, in cases of multiple murders, prosecutors will press charges in only one or two cases. This gives them another chance if a murderer is unexpectedly acquitted, Missing body cases are also hard to prosecute because you're asking a lot of a jury to convict someone for the murder of someone who could be alive. So it shows a lot of confidence in the case that the prosecution decided to roll all the cases together in one big trial. I'll say that their confidence wasn't misplaced. Lauren's body was found partially unclothed, an indicator that she'd been sexually assaulted. Lejibikov maintained that her clothes had come off when he dragged the body, but no debris was found in her clothing to indicate that. Jill's body also had signs that pointed to potential sexual assault. The Crown was certain that these murders were committed during a sexual assault, making them first-degree murder. During the trial, 98 witnesses would take the stand for the Crown. Now, neither of us has the time to listen to a summary of all of these testimonies but I'll go into a few of them. One witness was a woman named Nikita Cunningham, who knew Natasha Montgomery growing up 
and dated Cody Lejibkov. What was more damning for her ex was the fact that she could link him directly to Natasha. The three had met up in October 2010, and Lejibikov had taken them to a spot just east of Prince George Regional Correction Center. The LC Gun Park where Moss's body would be found isn't far from the PGRCC, if you remember. Yet another witness could tie Lejibikov and Natasha together and this witness implied that they'd continued to communicate through social media. While Melanie Reagan testified, she was clearly terrified of Lejibikov. When she identified him, she told him to stop staring at her, and a bailiff stood between them to block her view. However, she still told her story for her friend. One evening, Natasha asked Melanie to spot her during a date. In this case, spotting means watching another sex worker's back, making sure they weren't harmed by their client. Melanie agreed, and the pair got into Lejibikov's pickup truck. The trio drove on Highway 16 east past the PGRCC, a similar area to where Natasha had gone with Lejibikov and Nikita. Natasha said that this was their usual spot. Lejibikov made Melanie uncomfortable. She pretended she had to go to the bathroom and had him stop at a convenience store. Natasha followed her into the bathroom. Melanie tried to tell her that he was bad news, but Natasha wouldn't listen. Natasha and Lejibikov ended up leaving Melanie behind at the convenience store that night, forcing her to hitchhike back to town. When Melanie saw Natasha again, Natasha assured her that the pair communicated online and Lejibikov had never been a problem for her. It appeared that Lejibikov's usual routine was to lure his victims through social media, though most of his social media history wasn't revealed or discussed during the trial. But we know for certain that Natasha and Lauren were lured this way. Unfortunately, the last witness we've got to talk about is a witness for the defense. Cody Lejibikov himself and his ridiculous story. According to him, the killers were three men that he refused to name. He didn't want to be a snitch, so he referred to them only as X, Y, and Z. Or Z, I'm not sure. X was a drug dealer, and Y and Z were enforcers. According to Lejibikov, he'd known X for only a few months. The events went something like this. One night, Lejibikov had a party. At some point in the evening, X, Y, and Jill arrived together with a few other people. Lejibikov made moves on Jill, and they had consensual sex in his bedroom. When asked whether they had anal sex, because there were indications of anal rape on Jill's body, he said he couldn't remember. After sex, they rejoined the party, which dwindled down to just the four of them until he broke away again, this time to do drugs in his bedroom with Y. X came into the room after some time and informed Lejibikov that Jill was going to have to be murdered because of her drug debts. In answer to this, Lejibikov said he grabbed a pipe wrench and handed it to X without being asked, basically telling him to go for it. X killed Jill, and he and Y left with her body, which left Lejibikov to clean up the crime scene. We can all tell how ridiculous this is, right? X barely knows him. Why the fuck would he trust him enough to murder in his home? Or trust him enough to clean up after? He's seen his apartment! Also, why do you have a pipe wrench in your bedroom? And why the hell is it so easy for you to be an accessory to murder? Not even a token protest for the sake of not committing bloody murder on his damn couch. His stories didn't get better. According to Lejibikov, Cynthia was killed next. This is a lie, Natasha was killed next, but he wants to confuse the issue. He said a woman named Cindy showed up with X and Y, and they all smoked crack in the living room for a while. After a while, X and Cindy went around the corner into the dining room and were talking. Suddenly, Lejibikov heard a series of noises. A slap, a crack, a thud and when he jumped up to look, he saw Moss lying on her stomach next to some kind of weapon. 
X peaced out after this, leaving Lejibikov and Y to do cleanup. They took Moss to Elsie Gun Park, and when they took her out of the car, they noticed that she was still alive. Once again, Lejibikov said he handed a weapon to a murderer with no prompting, this time the Picaroon. Y dispatched Moss with a weapon, and they left the scene. This is bullshit. Likely, Lejibikov always intended to kill Moss at L.C. Gun Park, and that's because both Jill and Natasha's murder left a huge scene to clean up. He made the choice because he was evil and lazy. This makes even more sense when you see that he followed this pattern with Lauren, too. As for Natasha's murder, Lejibikov said X and Z slash Z brought her to his home. He testified that he'd never seen Natasha before. If X keeps murdering people at his place, why does he keep letting him in? According to his story, they did drugs until X suddenly told him that he was going to kill Natasha. Natasha was in the bathroom at that time, and X bludgeoned her with a steel bar as she returned. Natasha, apparently not dead or unconscious, fled from X towards Lejibikov's bedroom, but was overtaken and choked before finally having her throat cut by a knife that Lejibikov again handed over. Lejibikov also gave them an axe, to which he said, I never seen what they did with that. I chose not to look. The two other men left with Natasha's body wrapped up in a sheet, and Lejibikov stayed behind taking drugs and cleaning up. Unfortunately, there's not much we can outright do to disprove this story, because we don't have Natasha's body. But we know for certain he was lying about knowing Natasha. Two witnesses can place him with her. I already told you his lies about Lauren, and I won't repeat them, because they're offensive to her and her family. But hearing his whole story, one obvious fact jumps out. No matter what happens, what he's done, Lejibikov is never at fault for anything. From blaming the mysterious and fictional X, Y, and Z, to blaming Lauren, somebody else is always to blame. He even blamed the crack cocaine he took. Lejibikov is like a child who breaks a rule right in front of you and then blames you for it. Luckily, the jury didn't have any trouble seeing this for themselves. After one and a half days, they found Cody Lejibikov guilty of first-degree murder on all four counts. And on September 16, 2014, Justice Glenn Parrott sentenced him to four life sentences. Unfortunately, because sentences are determined based on the date the crime was committed, Lejibikov is eligible to apply for parole after 15 years under Canada's Faint Hope Clause. A law was drafted that made multiple murderers ineligible for the Faint Hope Parole Clause, but it was not a law at the time he murdered Jill, Natasha, Cynthia, and Lauren. During the sentencing and in his sentencing documents, which I will have a link to in my sources doc, Justice Glenn Parrott made a point of drawing a parallel between Lejibikov's crimes and the Highway of Tears cases. He said the following, I cannot end this trial without adding something more. I am aware of comments being made to the effect that there is no need to embark on any formal inquiry into missing and murdered women, that policing is the solution to this problem. With the greatest of respect to those of a different view, we should all be eternally grateful to a very young and inexperienced police officer whose instincts were sound and on the money. The grief and horrors we heard from the families may well have been simply a precursor to that which would have followed if good luck and fortune had not brought Constable Keller to that stretch of Highway 27 on the night of November 27, 2010. What followed was good sound police work that tried to integrate four separate investigations and bring them to trial. But make no mistake, it was luck that began those events. Parrott continued on, rightly, to say that this was a sociological issue, but it was one that he blamed on a high-risk lifestyle. It is a sociological issue, but he's wrong about the cause. Why did Lejibikov choose to attack Lauren? He talked to her over social media, 
texted her with his real phone, and left a trail a mile wide. He stole her phone, but even back in 2010, he had to know that he couldn't erase the evidence of their online interactions. Police investigations would have led right to his door. He did it because he had done the same thing with his other victims. We know for certain that he was seen with Natasha multiple times, and that he'd spoken with her on social media. Police investigation into her death should have flushed him out right away. But we all know that very little, if any investigation, was done into the deaths of Jill, Natasha, and Cynthia. Lechebikov thought he could get away with killing a 15-year-old girl, because the police showed him over and over that women were disposable. That's the real issue here, that there are certain people that society doesn't seem to give a shit about. This pattern repeats over and over in serial killer cases. Sex workers, LGBTQA plus people, people of color, or any marginalized group is killed, and no one cares until that same killer targets someone society thinks is more worthy of respect. And don't get me wrong, I'm not disrespecting Lauren. All the deaths in this case were tragedies. But it's hard to ignore that the media and police framing of this case treats these victims very differently. We all need to do better and remember that these people were human beings. Three of them were mothers, and one of them was just starting out in life. Each of them had families who lost an irreplaceable piece of themselves. And none of these women were responsible for their deaths. That was the case of the Prince George serial killings. I'm sorry, I was a bit much there. These cases make me so angry. I got a bit heated. I'm still working on the Unit 731 video. I promise I haven't forgotten. I just managed to overwhelm myself by working on three big cases at once. I finished this one, and the other one I'm going to push for multiple reasons. So I'll be working on the 731 case and some smaller cases for a bit until I get it up on Patreon. It's been a year since I started this podcast, and I wanted to thank all of you for sticking around. I know I've been terrible about things like upload schedules, but I'm going to try to get better. Honestly, I never thought anybody would listen to this. Except maybe my mom. Hi, mom. If you'd like to join my Patreon family, follow the link in the episode details. You'll get access to perks, like your name on the YouTube end screen. Ooh, pretty. Podcast listeners can't see it, but I swear it's there. You also get access to the Discord I made where I haunt the lonely, empty halls like a ghost. And there's bloopers! This episode had a ton. A side effect of recording in a sweltering room is that I make even more mistakes than usual. Honestly, your donations would help me buy a better mic and help me pay my podcast hosting fees. It also earns you my undying, platonic devotion. But even if you can't contribute monetarily, I love all of you. Even a like or a share makes my whole day. Seriously, I go around grinning like an idiot for hours. That's all I have for today, but it's getting really hot outside. Stay safe, stay cool, and stay hydrated.